Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Come on in, join me today as we speak to a woman who has possibly one of the nicest and most pleasant sounding voices you'll ever hear on radio or podcast. I'm talking about Sarah Wiseman, spiritual teacher, author, and more. I first read Sarah's book, Writing the Divine, about five years ago. And after I decided I wanted an interview and did some research, I discovered she has so many other things going on. So I can't wait to chat with her. Welcome, Ms. Wiseman. How are you today? I am just fine. Thank you for having me here today. No problem. I'm excited. Let's read Sarah Wiseman's bio. And this is right off of Amazon, actually. A spiritual teacher and intuitive counselor, Sarah Wiseman has taught thousands of students how to create a direct connection to the divine through intuitive training and spiritual development techniques via her books, courses, and private sessions. She's host of the popular Contact Talk radio show, Ask Sarah, and I believe it's called Sanctuary now, but she can tell us awesome, Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time. She's also a top contributor to Daily Ohm, where you can find her insightful courses, plus Vivid Life and many other holistic publications. An award-winning singer-songwriter, she's released four healing music CDs with her band Martyrs of Sound. She lives in Oregon with her family. And I also just want to say she has given me permission to play one of those tracks from one of those CDs. And so I'm excited later on to go find one and then enter it in somewhere in this episode. So I hope you enjoy that. Sarah, in the year 2000, you had what you've called a spiritual awakening that changed your life. What happened there? In 2000, I was living a pretty mainstream life. I was... And not all of this is mainstream, but but the collective of it, the, the combined efforts of all of this, I was pretty mainstream. I was married. I had four kids at home. I was working as an advertising copywriter. And I just really, you know, I just really wasn't on my path at all. And I think that I was pretty happy where I was or thought I was happy. And the universe decided that I needed a little shaking up. (laughs) So (laughs) in 2000, I had a a near-death experience on a plane. Um, I don't talk too much about it, but basically all of the oxygen went out and we didn't die. But what happened to me during that place where we almost died or we could have died or something just sort of broke open in me and the experience that I had in the plane cabin, you know, in, in near-death experiences where people are, say, in surgery or they have a car accident, they often go and have this, you know, tunnel of white light experience. And that isn't what happened to me. I think I was probably not quite that far along. But what happened to me was the cabin of the plane, like filled with this really palpable golden light and I had the sense that angelic beings were just like literally holding up the plane for us. And I just had this sense of suddenly like understanding the universe or understanding God or knowing it was real in a way that even after, you know, I'd been a Presbyterian and I'd been a Catholic and and even after those belief systems were there, nothing like this had ever happened. And so the plane had to do like an emergency landing and and we were all fine and but i was i was just changed by what i'd experienced and i came back home and very shortly after my dad passed away and i was with him pretty much at the time of his passing and got to be kind of witness to that and those combined events of 
experiencing the universe in a whole new way. And then watching someone basically cross over to the other realms. It's like it just sort of blew my circuits. <laughs> just everything, <laughs> everything I thought I knew, like was different in, in not just a way I'd read about in books. And I got to say, Patrick, I hadn't really, I didn't really, I wasn't listening to big seance podcast at that time. I didn't know anything about this whole new age world. I was mm -hmm. like taking the kids to soccer practice, kind of, that's where I was at. And so it just, it just opened it up. And then from that time, I just began to have these spiritual experiences and it took a long time all the way to 2004, a lot of things in my life had to change. I ended up getting divorced, which was very complicated and the grieving of my father and I lost some my job and everything just sort of went down um, into the cesspool <laughs> of despair at that moment. But in 2004, this I'm trying to kind of merge these. I don't want to go on forever about this, but um, in 2004, at the height of probably the the worst time when I was separating and moving actually that day into my place I would be living, I saw my first spirit guide and I saw this spirit guide, which I'd never heard of spirit guides. I, I knew about angels, but, and he just literally walked into, he just walked into the living room of where I was surrounded by these boxes and he just started talking to me. and. The interesting thing was now when I do this work, I don't, I see, I work with guides all the time, but this particular guide was so palpable, like not like you and I standing together, but very, very visually apparent, like very much stronger appearing than mostly now I just work in my mind's eye. So it felt like there was a lot of effort by the universe to sort of make sure I got it, you know, like hello, we're putting a lot of effort into creating this <laughs> physical embodiment, you know, please pay attention. So, so that was the start of my channeled writing when that spirit guide began to speak and I just began to return over and over and begin to write it down. That is so intense. I didn't know that. And, and you don't, you don't have to go here if you don't want to, but did you ever have contact after the fact with any of the other people on that flight to see if anyone else had any kind of experience? Yeah, you know, I did have contact with one woman, but that was more, um, she was doing some more like legal <laughs> suing people and things oh. like that. So, so I don't know that that counts, but, um, but I think the idea is like, yeah, she was pretty shaken up too. And I know her life changed, not in the same way maybe mine did, but mm -hmm. Every, I would imagine everybody got shifted from that particular event. Yeah, some way or another, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. That is intense. I'd say it was around 2007 or 2008 when I had what I've always called my uh, spiritual shift, which didn't at all involve you know me gaining any kind of intuitive abilities or anything. But my quest for learning about and reading anything I could uh, find on paranormal and spiritual topics was so strong, I just couldn't get enough. I think it all got started... Well, this is nerdy, but it kind of got started by watching Ghost Hunters. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but for the books, it got started when I, I uh, read a book by James Van Prog. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just started a whole parade of books. Now, your book, Writing the Divine, was also one of those earlier books that I read at the time. And, I mean, I was trying everything. Do you run into folks like me often, folks who didn't necessarily grow up with these ideas and all of a sudden, you know, maybe they're late bloomers and they just can't get enough. Yeah. And especially as we've moved, like this idea of 2012 being a, a very big shift in terms of how we understand things. I, I actually don't know if it's because I'm doing this work that I attract so many people who are interested in this work, you know, or we, we all, or if there's just more, mm -hmm. but I wasn't aware at all. And now it's like, this is the universe that surrounds me as people who are involved in this kind of stuff. And I do think, I do think that, you know, we've been brought up a lot of us in terms of these bigger religions or maybe no spiritual direction at all is sort of the trend for people of, in our kind of generations. Mm -hmm. And I think when we start to get experiential about it and uh, not wanting to offend anyone, but it feels to me that religions 
to some degree can't contain all of the new ideas or the new experiences that are happening to people. Mm -hmm. Religions are kind of a little bit of a top down thing. Whereas this new way of being is about each person can have their own direct connection with the guides, with the angelic realm, with the universe. Uh, So this idea that like religions kind of say the priest or the guru or the pastor has the ability to have the divine information and they're going to pass it down to you. But this new idea of direct connection is about we each can we each can make this exact same divine connection with no middleman required. And that's a very big shift for humanity. So before I read your book, channeled writing to me was you know, like the scene in the movie The Others, if anyone knows what I'm talking about. I pictured the stereotypical, you know, spiritualism scene where the medium has a pen in her hand for automatic writing and a spirit or perhaps a ghost takes over wildly and starts scribbling like crazy. Tell us what channeled writing is in 2014. Yeah, you know, that was channeled writing back in the spiritualist era, you know, in late 1800s, early 1900s. And if you're trying to channel right by hand nowadays or, or at, at back then too, you'll soon find that your hand wants to keep going to the right if you're right-handed or to the left if you're left-handed. And if you're really in this sort of trance, it can't. your hand can't really remember to make these line breaks. And so you either need a really long piece of paper, which in the that spiritualist era, they would actually use rolls of like wallpaper or you, they'd use rolls of paper so that mm-hmm. the hand could just keep going. So, of course, now we are so able to use laptop and computer and it makes it uh, back when I was in like mid high and high school, my parents <laughs> put me in all these typing classes. Right. And <laughs> their their idea was because, you know, honey, you're going to be a secretary, so it'll be really useful <laughs> for you to have these <laughs> typing classes. And so I dutifully went to summer school and took a lot of typing classes. So I'm this fantastic typist, right? And so now to close my eyes and key is like no big deal. Yeah. And I just sometimes joke that the guides picked me because I can type really good. Like, I, <laughs> so, but, but mostly what it involves is you just go into this light trance, you connect in with whatever guides are supposed to be there. And then you just say, you know, what would you like me to know? Or what messages do you have? Or um, often if I'm looking into my own, you know, personal life, I'll have maybe five questions that I've sort of predetermined and they'll say, Let, please tell me more about this, this query. And then it just, it just begins to come out. It's very interesting. And um, when I wrote Writing the Divine, I would just sit on the sofa with my little laptop and I just didn't even know where I was. It just, it just flowed out for until it was done for the day. And that's kind of how it worked. That's amazing. Now, when, when you yourself channel, and I think I know the answer to this question, but who are you channeling? I have had different groups of guides during this journey. The guide that I had that's mentioned in the book, Writing the Divine, Hajam, he's continued to stay with me the whole process. But the guides that showed up in, in that book, Miriam and Constance and Gabriel, Gabriel came back for a sequel, actually, but Miriam and Constance have not returned. I have, right now, I have a, two tall tall beings sometimes, and sometimes I have Merlin, which is really interesting. I'm not <gasps> Shut a, up, really? I have <laughs> yeah. a Merlin. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. And <laughs> I'm not, you know, it was really, when Merlin first showed up was several years ago, I was kind of like, oh, come on, Merlin, right? This is just, no. And then, but it was Merlin. And I, again, like, I didn't really know a lot about Merlin. I wasn't a Merlin fan, really. And and then I was, so I was really wrestling with this, like, it is Merlin, but I just was like, why is it so, I don't know, uh, what's that word? Like, a, not trite, but um, it seemed kind of like too much that it would be yeah. Merlin. And then I came back to the house I came back into the house and there on the floor of our laundry room was this kid's book and right in the middle, 
no idea why. No one had dropped it. It wasn't even our book. And I turned it over and it was this book, Merlin by T.A. Barrows. And I was just like, oh, well, Merlin, <laughs> thank you for the sign <laughs> so I can know. And so ever since then, I, I just have accepted like for some reason, that's, that's who it is. Yeah. So I think guides, the guides change in people's lives. Like as you're supposed to have different information, a different group comes and works with you. That's just, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping it together because <laughs> my next question had Merlin in right here oh. in the question <laughs> because. <laughs> oh, okay. That's funny. I have taken one channeling course and, you know, I have, I've not at all excelled in any of these things, but uh, the psychic who's a friend of mine who is kind of, you know, guiding us all to meeting our spirit guide. And, you know, Merlin just popped in my head. So often, you know, if people ask me, I'll say, well, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I have a spirit guide and I think his name is Merlin, but I don't know if I made it up. I don't know if he really is, but you know, I'm just going to roll with that. (laughs) Well, Merlin is a guide to not just me or you, but he's like, sometimes these beings that are really, a lot of people have Jesus or Kuan Yin or Buddha or Mary or this particular, uh, like a Native American style person or, mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of people have Merlin, at least that I work with. And what Merlin seems to be about is people who have a strong, like intellectual, like, like they are, have the ability to work with language and symbols pretty well pretty well is is what I have found about that group in particular. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if perhaps, since you obviously have the ability to work with symbols, with music, that that would be, he would be a a guide that would fit for you too. And maybe, maybe that's true. I also don't, I mean, here I am sitting here doing a podcast, but I also Mm -hmm. don't tend to excel in, you know, vocabulary, (laughs) things like that. So maybe that's another reason. Yeah, but here you are, yeah, doing a podcast and talk. <laughs> so, I know. I'm, I'm, yeah. wor- I'm working through it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the next question is a chapter right out of that book, Writing the Divine. Do you have to be psychic to channel? Well, everyone is psychic. Everyone has this ability. So you can you can sort of resist it if you want. <laughs> but... <laughs> but I don't, I don't know. It, it's sort of like saying, I, I don't even know how to, do you need to be able to think to, to write? It's like everyone can do this. But the the channeled writing piece, which when I wrote the book, I believed that it would be easy for everyone. I found that that's actually not the case. Um, people who do better in channeled writing are people who do better in general with language and, and words who who are writers actually who are easy with writing mm-hmm. is it it's if you're a very good artist you'd probably be better channeling art or but if you're a very good cook it, channeled writing might not be uh the right thing for you but in terms of channeling too I want to use the word receiving mm-hmm. because channeling's a bit of a word that connotates I don't know even bringing through some of the darker energies or bringing through just the departed and in my experience, channeling's really been about going to the guides, which is kind of like another, another, you know, like the departed are in one location and the guides are in another location. And um, I think in the olden days, spiritualist time, they used to channel a lot for the departed. It was around these world wars and people would go to mediums and say, can you channel, you know, my son who died in the war? And that was a great comfort to people. But nowadays it's felt like we've we've lifted off from channeling the departed as a practice, at least that's how I see it. And we're really more interested in um, working with these guides or helper beings that are like sort of trying to help humanity <laughs> improve, uh-huh. improve our mark, improve our marks, you know, because mm-hmm. we're not doing that great all the time. So it's just a difference in focus, whether you're reaching back into the past or you're reaching actually to another level of consciousness that's above our consciousness level. So I've always wondered this, let's say I've been receiving today and (laughs) I've got the information in front of me and, you know, 
I don't know, maybe there's like some second guessing or something that's going on in my brain because I know that's what would happen with me. Uh, now, how do I interpret? What what do I do now that it's in front of me? The first thing that you do is you trust. And this is almost like the biggest hurdle for a particular style of person. And it's either a person that, you know, has been pretty much working in a left brain rational intellectual style or a person who sometimes people who've really had Eastern traditions uh, where they go into meditation and they're just supposed to think no thought. It can be a little hard to begin to gather thoughts, but mostly this idea of trusting is a process. And I sort of think of it like a breadcrumb trail. So the divine begins to contact you And then after you receive the channeling or the channeling channeled writing, you're going to go off into your life and these incidences or synchronicities are going to begin to happen that will sort of verify the information you received. Now, if you're going out into the, into the world, not noticing or pretty distracted, you're going to miss all those. So it's about going out into the world, very aware and, maybe even grasping at like, is this a sign? Oh, maybe this is it. And <laughs> and being just like really on a little discovery, you know, a little piece of discovery until you sort of get the understanding of like, this is a sign, this is nothing. Oh, there's one. And it just is a, is a process. It's like a way of training yourself to kind of follow the synchronicities or the what I call links of synchronicities, which I call strands. Once you make direct connection with the universe in channeling, the universe is going to start to bring these synchronicities into your life. And by learning how to follow them, you are led to the best place that you need to be. It's sort of also like maybe this idea of, you know, on a treasure map, or I'm sorry, like a scavenger hunt. We don't just say, okay, we're doing a scavenger hunt and here's where the prize is. It's like we have to go to the the little maple tree with the hollow, and then there's the clue. And then we have to go to the the brook with the little crooked neck to it, and then there's the clue. And then we have to go to the old woman in the hut, and there's the clue. And so each time we take the next following, we receive the next information. We don't ever get the big X on the map just delivered down to us. Always a process. That's amazing. I didn't expect an answer. Anything like that. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. You also talk a lot in that in that book about manifesting. What is manifesting? Manifesting is it's a term used a lot in New Age or Unity Church. It's about creating what you want with the universe. And the idea of manifesting was intriguing to me because when you look at the word itself, it goes back to this idea of what's in the cargo of the ship. And that's kind of like what manifesting is. People think they're creating something new, like, okay, I want this new job, or I want to move to this house, or I want this relationship. And because of the way the universe is, like everything's happening always, all the time, it's like those possibilities exist already or are already happening. We just have to kind of call our awareness into that awareness. And so it's similar to like you're sailing along in this ship and you're like, oh, I'd really like that job. And like you just go check down in the manifest and down in the cargo and like, ah, the job's there already. It's been there all the time. You just Mm -hmm. needed to kind of pull it up or pull it onto the deck. So that idea of, I've written, um, the manifesting, that first book, Writing the Divine, created a lot of questions uh, for me. So manifesting, I wrote a course, uh, Manifest Miracles, that kind of further information came about the process. And then in that book, there's a lot of discussion of the heart's passage of opening. And then there was a sequel, another period of channeling that came that talks about the heart's opening. So the book sort of was the first A lot of the things that I'm dealing with now in terms of exploring came forward in that book that I'm still like doing more work on. So you're talking about um, the four passages of the heart moving from pain into love. Yes, right. 
Do you want to talk about those those four passages? I mean, is there a way you can kind of briefly, you know, mm. kind of summarize those? Well, I think I think when I began this journey, I called myself a psychic or a channel. And I began to see as I did more and more work, and by work I mean inner work, like going in and connecting definitely every day, sometimes multiple times a day, and sometimes like in terms of the channeled writing, entering in like, you know, for for multiple hours maybe of being in this state. And I began to I began to really shift my understanding because of all this going in to work with the guides. And then the path really shifted. I didn't want to use the term psychic because psychic implies a person that's going to tell your future. Mm -hmm. And then you just like, go do that. And you're set. (laughs) No decisions (laughs) needed. And that's really like giving away your own power, your own, you know, free will and, and your own ability to create your destiny. And it really began more the path of how do you help people? Like so many people are in pain. Like obviously there's great suffering in the world. And, but in the U S often people who have all manner of material items are like majorly suffering in turn, you know, in their inner self. So how does that get alleviated? And that was where the four passages of the heart came of how the heart opens from pain into compassion, into connection, into love as a progression like you can't jump a step so my work began to be more about like you know how do we get through this life or what do we do with our dark thoughts or what do we do with our shadow selves or it began to turn much more to those types of questions than oh psychic phenomena or here's a here's a ghost that was just my path i think there's room for everything actually but Mm -hmm. that was what I was guided to work on. So you've got both a blog and a radio show found online and, and you do take a lot of callers and have people ask you a lot of questions. Do you want to just talk about uh, those things so that people can find those? Yeah, sure. So if you go to my website, sarahwiseman.com, I kind of tend to switch my radio day and time (laughs) I'm not very consistent, but it's it's like the most current details are there. So that's at sarahwiseman.com. You can get the, all the free podcasts. And I take live callers every show, usually try and fit as many as we can. And then I do some teaching. And then just lately, I've been very organized with my blog and I'm putting up a series of weekly lessons on, um, like right now we've been working on synchronicity. So I've been putting up pretty lengthy white papers on like how synchronicity works or how convergences work or uh, what to do when you're not getting guidance. You know, just these, these questions of uh, how the universe is communicating back to us and with us. What's the, what's the most popular kind of question you tend to get? Oh my gosh. It's not a good question. (laughs) (laughs) No. Okay. This is not the question. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is not this is not the question I get on the show, but when I look <laughs> when I look at when I look at you know the the questions that come in in it, like uh, the way people search or the way the main question is should I get back together with an old flame or <laughs> my lover is married is it going to work it's like, <laughs> no 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 it's no no <laughs> Those are the oh answers. gosh so people but see this is like. So how do you work with folks to get them to an understanding of like why energetically, psychically, spiritually, those positions are blocked? And, you know, so that's sort of, I, that's sort of the challenge is like, what are people confused about? And like, how do you figure out a way to translate from the guides in a way that makes sense to just you and me, you know, like, oh, I get it. That makes mm-hmm. sense. So that's kind of, I pay a lot of attention to what people are searching for in terms of what are the big problems people face. Mm -hmm. Because it's no fun. Those are, I'm kind of joking, but those are pretty big situations for people. And Yeah. You teach some courses as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. I began 
I unleashed my techie self <laughs> and uh, I created Intuition University a couple years ago. So we have a full distance program that I do with small groups. And then I also have, if that's like, you know, too time consuming or the price doesn't work, I also have a lot of courses uh, just at a low price point that people can just do home study to help get the information out. Tell us about Martyrs of Sound. Is It's your band and you're a fabulous vocalist. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Martyrs of Sound was my, we were working, we were driving up to Seattle. We were trying to figure out the band name. And we were, my son had come up with Brothers of Ohm. And I'm like, it's kind of close. It's not quite it. And that's <laughs> went with Martyrs of Sound. But and it is about, it's like surrendering to, it's like surrendering to the sound. My uh, husband was a Sikh and a Sikh tradition, they do a lot of mantra and kirtan and different sound healing. And so he came, I, and all of this was very new to me, but we wanted to do um, some mantra music that was really different than traditional or super electronic. Mm-hmm. And... So sort of pretty early in our relationship, music, we did music for a couple of years really strongly. And right now, there's no new music. And I explained explained to you earlier, Patrick, like we don't, we don't read or write music. So it's a little complicated to, it takes longer to create things. But right now, right now there's no music, but we did four albums and um, it was phenomenal. It was great. It's really interesting. Well, the cool thing about, uh, you know, this day and age is when you create it, it's there forever. So yeah, yeah, it will always be there helping folks. Now you, you include other music as well in your, uh, podcast or your radio show. How do you go about finding that music? Oh, thank you for reminding me. I'm really happy to talk about that. So I'm just a music lover. I used to dance around the downstairs basement. That was my activity after school. (laughs) So I have a great love for these independent, smaller bands, a lot of times that are going like on the festival circuit all over West Coast, you know, wherever they're, Canada, wherever they're going. And so I just decided I wanted to bring that music to the listeners. And so I just, I just email everybody and say, Hey, uh, can, can I play your music on the air? And they're like, yes, please, please do. And so it's been really beautiful. I don't know that these names will make sense to everybody, but uh, David Newman and Nautica Gopika and Desert Dwellers and Jamie Janover and Kevin Lucas Orchestra. So these are all people that I consider, that's just a s- short list of um, people that are doing this amazing sound therapy, healing music, mantra, electronica, dub, kind of all squished together into this really odd MC Yogi, who I don't have permission from yet, but I'm hoping to get doing a new style, a new style of very transcendent, hopeful, awesome music. So this is probably a good place for me to insert a track from one of your uh, CD. So unless you have an idea of one specifically you'd like for me to play, do you have one specifically or do yeah, you just I pick think, one? I think if you, on the basis of what I just said, I think our song Ananda, which is in the Sanskrit mantra and it's uh, more uh, beat oriented, could be kind of fun for people. Cool. Well, I'll uh, insert that here and then <laughs> we will be right back.
You're listening to the Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes and be sure to check out BigSeance.com for more discussion. Greetings, Big Seance Podcast listeners. Your host has asked that I make a special guest appearance to let you know of some exciting episodes coming up in the next three weeks. I'm not really sure how he got my email address. I don't usually do these podcast gigs, but it is hey. my favorite holiday, hey. and, and so I made an exception. Uh, excuse me. Oh, oh hold hey. on, hold on. Uh, yes? Stick to the script, please. Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I just did three interviews this afternoon. Uh, what show is this again? The Big Seance uh, oh, Podcast. Oh, The Big Seance Podcast will have three special episodes in the coming weeks to celebrate Halloween. You won't want to miss them. It'll be chilling, spooky, blood curdling. The ghosts and goblins will be there. I'm sure there will be face painting as well. Yada, yada. Boo. Okay, am I done? Yes. 
Oh, oh, excuse me. That's my hot bucket. I, I can never get it hot enough in the microwave. Oh, look. We've got listener feedback. Hi, Patrick. It's Karen. Um, it has been a while since I have reviewed anything, but I wanted to let you know I have been listening to every podcast. And, of course, I'm always excited to see them. They make my week. I especially like the last one, um, Pets in the Afterlife, the Rob Gutro podcast. As usual, they're all ex- excellent and totally enjoyable, and thank you for doing them. Uh, have a good day. Bye. Thanks for joining us for the Big Seance Podcast. We'd better get back to the table while there's still some candlelight left. Okay. Uh, so do you have any final thoughts or information you'd really like to talk about before we're we're done today? Something maybe we didn't get out? Yeah, I think it was interesting what you said about um, being so fascinated by, you know, suddenly tuning into this information or this different dimension and sort of researching everything. And I think the main message that I've been here to, I'm supposed to get out is like, everybody can, everybody can make this direct connection in their own lives. And so even if you think you can't, it's very much worth it to try and just try again and just trust that it's going to be happening. I think there is a lot of a lot of the ghost stuff or a lot of the darker stuff on TV, you know, internet or movies or whatever, it's pretty dark and like, it's pretty easy to get enthralled with that, but that's sort of a dramatization of it's not, it doesn't really work that way. So almost more turning toward the idea of entering in, learning to channel yourself, meditating as a path, a bridge, to really like, like instead of watching it on a movie, like just go in there and do it yourself and begin that practice. And uh, the places you can go with that are just phenomenal. And the understanding that will come to you as a, as a soul is amazing. Well, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you and, and have you on the podcast. And I'm going to put links and things in the show of anything we've talked about. Are there any other links or social media pages that you you want to throw out there? I think really um, everything's just totally on my website, sarahweisman.com. That's okay. pretty, pretty full of resources and things. So that would be the place. Well, well, Sarah Wiseman, you totally rock. I have enjoyed this conversation a lot. Thank you. Oh, it's Mike. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. I'm glad to have met you this way. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com, now the home of both the blog and the podcast. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Do you have any comments or feedback? Please contact me at Patrick at BigSeance.com. You can call my feedback line at 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775 775- 583-5563. You can also record audio feedback right from the site using the SpeakPipe link included in the show notes. I could decide to include your voice in a future show. Thank you so much for listening and reading. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out. But we'll see you and light them again next time. <laughs>